Hello, I'm Ann Petrick, Vice President of Research for Vistage. I'm happy to host the latest webinar in the Peak Performer Webinar Series. This series is designed to support your leadership climb by bringing the most trusted experts to the Vistage community. Experts who provide exceptional insight and best practices to help you navigate new challenges and possibilities. Last year, our research showed that 76% of CEOs plan to raise prices over the next 12 months. And our most recent Vistage CEO Confidence Index survey conducted in June showed that the same proportion, 76% plan to raise prices in the year ahead. These subsequent in price increases intended to mitigate the effects of rising costs. Our research shows that the top inflationary pressures reported by CEOs include wages and compensation with 89% reporting these pressures and 82% reporting that increased prices from vendors are a challenge. So to help you navigate your approach to pricing to preserve your profits, we've invited Vistage speaker, Casey Brown, president of Boost Profits to share how to adapt your pricing strategy in these uncertain times. As president of Boost Profits, Casey leads a group of consultants who help companies sell more at higher prices to increase profit. Casey's unique background of engineering, Six Sigma, and pricing strategy for multiple Fortune 500 companies provides a rich backdrop of real-world application, which has helped her establish herself as an expert in helping clients discover their true pricing power and watch their prices and profits rise as a result. Today, she'll share the importance of surgical price change to both improve profits and minimize volume risk, confidence building communication tactics for your price increases, and best practices for adjusting your pricing strategy as demand decreases, even as costs rise. Over to you, Casey, welcome. Thank you so much, Anne, and uh, welcome to Vistage members and uh, and guests. I'm uh, delighted to be addressing this community again. And uh, without further ado, let's let's get into it. Where uh, we can help uh, businesses through the the current climate. So, uh, by way of a precursor to the content here, I want to uh, make one point. So, what you see on your screen here is a silver bullet. And uh, everyone dialed in or is going to listen to the recording because uh, it would be fantastic to get a silver bullet. Like, what's the answer? What's the easy path forward through all the complexity uh, and realities of our current economic and market situation? And the, the sad uh, fact I have to deliver right up front uh, to disappoint everyone, hopefully, uh, hopefully not to disappoint anyone, is that there is no silver bullet. It's not that simple. It's not that easy. Uh, it's uh, slogging through a lot of what you already know how to do, but making sure you're doing it with discipline, rigor, consistency, and confidence. So I'm sorry I don't have an easy answer to uh, the, the environment we're operating in. If I did have an easy answer to it, I wouldn't be on a uh, webinar right now. I'd be on my private island in the Pacific floating along being fed uh, great you know, grape, uh, grapes one at a time. So it's not easy, it's not simple, uh, but it is necessary. And I hope that over the course of the next hour to be able to share some nuggets, some tidbits, some thoughts uh, that will give you more confidence in your current strategy or help you make some tweaks and tunes to the strategy you already have. So with that, let's, let's dive into it. So uh, 1981 is on your screen. So some of you who are watching this webinar were not even alive in 1981. Uh, many of you were alive, but not yet in the workforce, or you were in the workforce, but uh, not in a leadership position, not in a, a position of running a company, making long-term strategic, effective decisions about sales and pricing. Uh, it's likely that only one or two or three out of our hundreds of participants maybe uh, was a, a leader, a manager, an owner in 1981. And the reason that's relevant is 1981 is that the last time is the last time we have seen inflation of this magnitude. Uh, that's the last time uh, the you know we're we're experiencing 40-year highs in the consumer price index. Uh, likewise, uh, 1974 is the last time the uh, the producer price index, which is an important predictor of inflation in business uh, to business environment, was this high. Uh, commodity price index, all of these are hitting these, you know, historic, you know, multiple decades since we've experienced these conditions. And so for most of us in a business leadership role, we've never lived through this. What's happened over the past, you know, 12 to 18 months, we have no experience that has prepared us for that relative to the inflation 
uh, bit, but that you add to that inflation, the realities of COVID, the realities of the supply chain interruptions globally. Uh, it's been certainly for me an, an unprecedented set of business conditions. And I think a lot of businesses that we speak to are telling us that too. So it's no surprise to anyone on the on the call here that we're experiencing inflation. Uh, if you look at uh, different economists have different opinions about how entrenched uh, inflation is becoming, but there isn't really a question that uh, anytime soon, we're going to go back to pre-pandemic levels. The you know the past twenty years of stability of you know one two three percent. That higher levels of inflation are here to stay. What do we do with that as we head towards recession? And again, depending on which economist you listen to, uh, or or which market you're in, you may already be experiencing the headwinds of recession. Uh, but everyone really agrees it's a question of how much and and when. But no one uh, disagrees that it's going to happen. So here we are with inflation crashing into recession. Uh, what what kind of conditions does that cause? Well, uh, again, something I didn't live through the first time around uh, as a business leader, but stagflation, which hasn't been around for 40 years, the idea of entrenched inflation, continual rising costs, uh, slowing economic, um, you know, the, the, just the economy cooling off overall and slower demand that can lead to, um, you know, um, unemployment. Um, the other thing that happens in the, in the environment of these two conditions occurring together is this price wage spiral. And, you know, Ann mentioned some statistics about how, how impactful to many businesses this issue of more expensive uh, wage and compensation has been, this uh, wage inflation that has been going on, uh, whether you're talking about you know, frontline workers, um, you know, unskilled, skilled trades, knowledge workers, everywhere across the, the talent uh, retention and acquisition uh, spectrum, the costs are higher. And uh, as wages, as those wages get institutionalized, as the inflation gets institutionalized as higher prices, now we have higher prices, which means we have less buying power, which means we need to raise prices uh, a wage again. So this turns into a spiral uh, potentially, and it's happened in, in past economic conditions. And, and I think that's a, that's a little bit about what we're experiencing right now. And then you add to that, the um, the the business reactions, and I know a lot of Visage members are business to business uh, companies, and so your customers are starting to hold cash, be a little more conservative, you know, put projects on hold, stretch things out. You know, some of them are in a let's wait and see mode, and that can really cause uh, that. You know, that's another effect that happens in this inflation plus recession environment. And then some unique things about the current situation, of course, the war in Ukraine, um, uh, particularly Europe, but frankly, the globe's dependence on Russian energy, that uh, situation is very much um, in flux and at play. And then the, the supply chain uh, challenges uh, ever since COVID that continue. Now, what we're seeing all, across a lot of companies is, um, you know, backlogs are starting to shrink a little bit. They're getting caught up. But supply chain interruptions over the past 18 plus months have continued to affect the current and cl climate in which we operate. And when I think about all this chaos and all this um, complexity, I'm reminded of a quote from uh, an MIT economics professor, Rudy uh, Dornbusch, who said, a crisis takes much longer coming than you think and then happens much faster than you thought. And so the word crisis, we could agree or disagree, applies in the, in the current and coming environment. I don't know if it'll be that bad. I hope not. But but there certainly is a confluence of a lot of factors that are creating uh, a lot of challenges for businesses. Uh, these things don't typically, in, in my experience, happen all at the same time, and now they are. And so we're, we're, we're staring down the barrel of a crisis, and it's not here, it's not here, it's not here, and then all of a sudden it'll be here. And so it's really important to get ready. It's really important to be uh, prepared uh, to weather what's what's going to happen, what's been happening and what's going to continue to happen. Um, you know, the NBA introduced the shot clock in 1954. Prior to that, clock only stopped if the ball um, went out of bounds or if a team called timeout. So when the shot clock came in, it had some really big impacts on the style of play. So set plays became more common. There were changes to the way teams um, approached uh, plays. So in other words, it made less sense to leave centers in the paint. Passing became faster. So there's a lot of things about the style and rate of play that changed when the rules changed, um, but they also impacted results a lot. So there were more good shots, higher scores, higher field goal percentage, um, more rebounds, 
So, I mean, and we're talking not a little bit of difference, but a lot of difference. And then a, an unintended, interesting um, side effect was fan attendance increased 40% over the next few years. So it got more exciting and interesting. So what's the uh, ramification for business owners who are not NBA players or coaches or owners? It's a little bit the same. It feels a little bit like, you know, we're operating with a shot clock where we didn't before, or better said, there's always been a shot clock on business um, because of life and economic conditions. It's, um, it's changed. How much time we have on the clock is less than we've ever had before. The, the rate of change, the speed of change, the speed of disruption is faster than ever. Um, and so that is going to change the style and rate of play, and it's also going to change the results. And it will also have some unintended, unexpected consequences besides that. Uh, wh why that I think is exciting is because to me, that's opportunity. Yes, it's challenge, but it's opportunity. Uh, you know, you could take one of two strategies in the face of, of what's here and what's coming. You know, one is to just hunker down, play it safe, hold cash, reduce risks, keep your team, you know, small, just, just wait it out, try to wait it out. Uh, there are some advantages and there are some um, lessons uh, that I think are important to, to consider when we talk about a hunger down type strategy that we might want to selectively apply. But my proposed strategy for businesses in this climate, rather than hunker down, is more of a buckle up. So in other words, there may be some careful and cautious strategies we want to implement today, but it also might be the time to make a big bet to take a big risk, to spend. Um, the best companies a year from now and two years from now and five years from now are not necessarily and almost certainly not going to be the ones that hunkered down and played it safe. It's the companies that are fastest at adapting and willing to take the risks. You know, millionaires, billionaires are not made in the, uh, not nearly as much in the boom times as it is at the times of re recession and challenge because there's more opportunity, more ability to differentiate versus the average company in, in hard times than there is in good times. Um, and almost every business that we're talking to is in what Andy Grove, who wrote uh, Only the Paranoid Survive, um, he calls it a strategic inflection point. There's something very different about our current climate than ever before. And it, it calls us to be uh, what Ben Horowitz uh, in um, a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, what he calls a wartime CEO. So I, you know, what is a wartime CEO? It's a CEO who runs the company when all hell breaks loose. And they manage that chaos over the course of a long period of time uh, that maybe there's a nice edge between survival and failure. Um, and, and here's some of the, the key differences uh, that, that Ben Horowitz described as the difference between a peacetime CEO and a wartime CEO. So peacetime CEO is, is big picture, empowers people to run the decision making. Wartime CEO, and I, I love this, the way this is worded, cares about a speck of dust on a gnat's ass if it interfered with the prime directive. So an intense laser focus, even to a detailed level, is necessary when we're operating in a, in a wartime scenario. Uh, peacetime CEO is very focused on building and expanding, while a wartime CEO is focused on retrenching and, and obsessive focus on threats and, and neutralizing those threats. Uh, war peacetime CEO fires people up, while a wartime CEO keeps people focused. Uh, focus and speed are the name of the game in, in, in the wartime economic conditions. Um, oops, wrong button. Uh, Peacetime CEO has contingency plans and the wartime CEO knows they have to roll a hard six sometimes. There's no contingency plan. There's no backup. We're going, we're laying it all out of the line. Um, big, hairy, audacious goals is a peacetime CEO uh, strategy. And wartime CEO, uh, again, this is a quote I love, too busy fighting the enemy to read management books written by consultants who have never managed a fruit stand. So it's, it's, an, it's a time for extreme practicality and 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 focus. We can't do the 10 things that we plan to do this year. We can do two and we're going to do them very well. And we're going to punt on the other eight. So what is the, what is my recommendation as a pricing geek for pricing strategy? If you're a wartime CEO right now, if you're navigating tough times, or if you anticipate tough times on the way, well, it's, it's four things. Uh, Charles Schultz uh, in the buildup, the nuclear buildup of the nation used this uh, phrase called careful urgency which I think is really interesting. It feels a little paradoxical, but I think we can operate with adaptability and speed, but not rush and panic. 
And so, you know, sort of a slow down to speed up thing. What is the carefully urgent way to go forward? How do we focus? A very, very uh, narrow view on right now. Uh, the second is a surgical approach, and Ann mentioned, mentioned this in the introduction, the, the idea of how to focus on core customers, products and services, um, segmentation, uh, even mixed strategy, and the role that that plays on our ability to weather the um, inflation plus recession environment. Uh, messaging for right now, making sure that our sales messaging and our value propositions and how we communicate, how we help is very, uh, it reflects the environment that not only that we're living in, but more importantly, that our customers are living in and what they're facing. And finally, supporting and arming the team. Because of the chaotic in nature of all the scenario, of all the um, situation that I've just described, that really can create a spiral of, of confidence, a downward spiral of confidence for your team. And so how to keep the team uh, in the game in the right way uh, given the current climate is, is the fourth piece. And I'm going to go through each of these four in a little bit more detail. So let's start with focus and careful urgency. And as a, as a way of starting, I'm going to uh, remind, uh, and I've, I've used this in a lot of presentations to, I don't know, 250 Vistage groups. So some of you may have heard me say this before, but there's a Navy SEAL saying, which is slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Uh, I see and hear in times of economic strife, some panicking, some reaction, you know, knee jerk reactions, some, you know, oh my gosh, all of our competitors are slashing prices. Let's rush in and do that. Or let's grab for, you know, the scraps of a smaller pie. Um, they see, you know, pipelines, you know, drying up a little bit or backlog is getting shorter and, and you know, sales cycles stretching out. And, and our reaction can be a little bit panicky at times. Um, I would say that panicky reactionary pricing is the is the fastest way to a price war, and there are no winners in a price war. Everybody loses. So, of course, you need to gather information um, quickly. You've got to react in a responsive way, but but don't don't panic. Uh, price war, by the way, it's it's lightning fast on the way down, and clawing back to a price and a, and a margin that reflects your value over time can take years or be impossible to do. So remember, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Develop a strategic plan, execute it quickly and with precision, but there's a difference between quickly and in a rush. The second thing I'll say regarding um, focused and careful urgency around our strategy, I just want to um, share what I see as a pitfall. And this has certainly been the case uh, over the past 18, 24 months as uh, many industries have been dealing with some uh, out of control inflation. But I, I believe this is a lesson we have to keep in mind even as we go forward and even as we have to be a little bit more cautious. Uh, companies respond to increased costs too little and too late. And, and here's how this shows up. So if you get a letter today from your supplier that says this price is going up uh, effective next week, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month that we use that information to plan our next move before we put in a price increase, we perseverate, we meet, we love to get the spreadsheets out and do all the analysis and figure out customer by customer plans. And we meet again and we wring our hands and we argue about it and we're afraid about it. And by the time that price increase goes into effect, you know, a week after the, the, the higher prices started coming into play or two weeks or a month or six months, there is a permanent sacrifice of margin for not acting and reacting more quickly. While I think it's uh, essential to be really surgical and strategic with our moves, which is what I'm gonna talk about next, I do not think that even as recession weakens demand, that, that we can avoid the reality of the cost increases resulting in price increases for our customers. And uh, I would encourage you not to waver uh, to have the have the discipline and have the confidence to continue to push price where appropriate, uh, even in the face of softening demand. Now, what I will say is, over the past year or two years, um, there hasn't been a need to be terribly strategic with price increases for a lot of industries. It's been a you know a, a complete um, you know it's been wild wild west. It's been chaos. Prices have gone up so dramatically, so quickly, and supply chains are so challenged that often the question isn't from your customer, what does it cost, but when can I get it? 
when can you start this project? When can you ship me this product? And so um, price increases in my experience over the past two years haven't had to be wildly strategic to be successful. I think that what is changing over the next 6, 12, 18 months is is that piece. We still will need to do price increases, but we will need to be extremely strategic in order to minimize the risk of volume loss. So, so don't do, too, do, too, do it too late and definitely don't do it too little. So another strategic mistake I see a lot of companies making when it comes to the, you know, reacting to inflation and passing that through to customers is, um, you know, maybe attempting to absorb some of those costs to protect customers or trying to stay margin neutral rather than gain ground with margin. The challenge is that uh, it's a rare company that gets, that realizes as much price increase as they targeted, either because of uh, execution gaps with their team and, and reps that want to protect this customer because of the strategic opportunity or what have you. And so we often get less than we ask for. And so we've got to ask for more. I believe the right strategy isn't necessarily just to stay margin neutral, but it's to gain ground. And at the end of the day, maybe you'll be margin neutral. Too many companies over the past two years have tried to stay margin neutral and keep ahead of uh, costs with price increases only to find themselves very margin compressed because they weren't able to execute uh, either in time or in magnitude the price increase that was necessary to stay margin neutral. So again, this strategy and this pitfall that I just described is absolutely still just as essential in the coming year or two years. It's just got to be done in an extremely surgical fashion. So that, that leads me to, to point number two, surgical approach to pricing. So price increases, again, have not been terribly strategic over the past 18 months. We just jam prices and our customers have to take it because they need it. Uh, now, that may not be true for everyone listening, but in a lot of industries, that's been the scenario. We can't afford to operate in that fashion as demand tightens. We can't do the peanut butter knife approach. We have to get out our scalpel and be very, very careful where there's a lot of competition or where we're not very differentiated. And we can be a little bit more aggressive uh, in the areas where we're where we are more differentiated or where there's a little less sensitivity, which um, brings me to this idea of um, stretching out our products and services and and taking a really uh, refined approach to how we manage pricing and price increases as the market conditions change. And you know, think about like this, so the sunshine idea. This is this is the set of your products and services which are in the full glare of the customer right the sun is beating down on it everybody sees it it is there is no it is a very big part of the spend maybe you face a lot of competition on it and so pricing changes in the in the in the full sunshine have to be pretty cautious and that doesn't mean don't do them but make sure that you have a lot of precision gather as much information, market intel, customer and intel and competitive intel so that you can make as careful a decision as possible. Because of course, because this tends to be the bulk of our revenue, this can be the, the biggest risk to our business if we make a misstep and, and uh, push too far with pricing. So um, less uh, opportunity now than there was in this bucket a year ago. Still opportunity exists, but we've got to, we've got to move uh, slowly because of the risk of this bucket. I'm reminded of the Jim Collins quote, bullets before cannons. So where can we, even with those sunshine products and services, are there certain customers we can take a price increase to and test the market? Where are the lowest risk uh, places to take price that still give you the best results? So uh, that's the sunshine piece. On the other end of the spectrum is, is what we call, you know, the shade products or services. And this is where there's just a little less scrutiny, a little less attention, a little less price sensitivity. And it may be because um, it's a small part of a spend. It's a kind of a, and some add-on. Yeah, throw that in the cart. Or it may be because you're very differentiated, very specialized, do not have a lot of competition on some of those solutions. So. Um, in especially in recession and in crisis, it's this bucket that is your biggest opportunity for pricing. Now, it typically doesn't, you know, because it's not your core, it may not make up a lot of your revenue, but it's where there is the least amount of risk. And so while price power um, might degrade over the coming months, in especially in the sunshine products, it's less likely to, to have degraded as much in the shade. And so if you've got to negotiate 
uh, with a massive customer uh, and, and some price concession is necessary to stay in the same place with them, to not lose share, to not lose a big customer as we head into this recession, don't do it across the board, you know, 10% price, price uh, cut. Where can you maybe be very careful and very surgical with your discounts on your most sensitive products and services and then keep your, your shade products the same or maybe even look for for opportunities to raise the price. And then of course the shadow stuff's the sort of stuff in between. It's, you know, maybe it's it's shade product for one customer, but sunshine for another, or maybe it's just sort of in the middle regarding the level of competitiveness and commoditization. Um, but, but the more we get granular in our price increase planning, the more successful we will be realizing that price and the less risk we will take on losing volume. Too often I see a price increase strategy that, you know, say you're a professional services firm and you, you know, raise all the rates of your engineers by $5 an hour. Well, the problem with that is, you know, for some of your engineering projects that are very, very price sensitive, that's going to put you out of right, out of range. And for some of your uh, other more differentiated engineering projects, you're still too cheap. And so, you know, for every customer that would have paid you $5 more, somebody else would have paid you seven, nine, 10, $15 more. So uh, it takes a little more time and planning to be as surgical and strategic as I'm describing, but the payback in terms of increased profitability and reduced risk of volume loss is, is tenfold. Uh, likewise, not just on the product and service side, but on the customer side. You know, getting granular and, and segmented on your customer focus, concentrating on the core customers, honing in there, recognizing that what's going on with your core customers is your early warning system. So if you are starting to see orders slow down or deals take longer to close with your core customers, that's a signal to you of what's going to happen uh, across the market. Um, these customers, so the core customers tend to, you know, be the ones that spend a lot of money with you. They're, you know, a handful or maybe a small percentage of your customers make up a big chunk of your revenue. They are your core customers because they connect intimately with your value proposition. The products and services that you sell them solve a real problem for them and they continue to spend with you and grow with you. So they're the, they're the center of your bullseye in terms of your competency, typically. The outside of the bullseye, these are, you know, maybe what I would broadly called non-core customers. These are customers um, for whom maybe your products and services aren't a, a perfect fit, or maybe they are, um, they tend to also be the customers a lot of times that are lower margin, or they don't pay you on time, or they suck up disproportionate organizational resources. These guys in the fringe, they take a lot of time. The cost to serve our non-core customers uh, is very high, but they're not generating a lot of uh, revenue and, and margin dollars for us relative to the core. And so, the way I think of the environment we're in right now, it's stormy waters uh, because of the, the economic climate, because of COVID, because of the supply chain, because of the cost of energy and transportation and materials and labor. We're in stormy waters and this, this ship is low in the, in the water, right? And when your ship is low in the water, you got to throw all non-essentials overboard. It's a, you know, it's a game of, of, of survival and thriving. And so what can be thrown overboard? And I'm not suggesting you you cut all these other customers, but you'd be very intentional. Again, back to the wartime CEO, focus is essential. So how do you minimize the amount of time and effort that you're spending on those customers uh, to protect the core? Because if one or two or three or 10 of your non-core customers leave, the impact to your business is much lower than if one or two of your core customers leave. So make sure you're taking care of them and very, very focused on serving them. So that takes me to number three, which is messaging for now. So, so your customers, uh, if your customer is a business or an organization, your customers, just like you, are very focused on managing costs and cash right now. As we're starting to peer into a, an economic slowdown, cash is starting to be a bigger and bigger part of conversations. Uh, customers are, you know, delaying projects or cutting scope. Um, the other thing that's happening is they're taking a hard look at how to manage the risk to their business so that often what that means when we're managing risk is we it shortens the planning horizon. And so what might have a great long term ROI, you know, might make a, one of your customers millions of dollars in the long run. That's a luxury right now. Uh, so they are looking at managing short term risk and short term revenue maintenance and management. 
I know that's true because that's what you're all worrying about too. And so given that that's the customer's mindset and what the customer is seeking to do as we head further into recession, what we need to think about is how to address and adjust our sales messaging to uh, reflect that reality. So any nice to haves are not going to be a priority for most businesses for the next two years, let's say. Therefore, how we position, how we talk about, how we sell, how we message, what we do is mandatory, essential to survival, to risk management, to revenue growth, to customer service. Uh, or if you're if your um, customer is a consumer, same thing. How do you make sure that they understand that to achieve their fundamental goals, that this is a this isn't a nice to have, it's essential. Now that's that's not different, by the way. Uh, that's not different advice that I would give any time. Of course, you're going to be more successful in selling and selling at the highest price if you're able to make a, a case of the criticality of your product or service to your customers. Um, but again, even though this advice is always true, the, the stakes of being pretty good at it versus excellent or mediocre versus pretty good, the stakes are much higher on this as we head into the current environment. Uh, the next thing is, again, I, I mentioned this, the, the planning horizon for a lot of businesses has shrunk a little bit, especially if any of those businesses are in um, in an untenable cash position or they're facing a, a lot of impact to their revenue. So they're not, you know, maybe planning three or five years out, they're planning one year out or a quarter out. And so the degree to which your products and services address and provide a massive impact up front uh, that's going to be great. The the other thing is that it can't. It's not just about the messaging and the, and the product and service structure itself. It could also be about things like terms. Like people are trying to spread, you know, spread out how uh, much cost they incur right now. So is there an opportunity to instead of charging a million dollars for a machine, you lease it to them for seventy thousand dollars a year for X number of years? Uh, so the idea of, of risk reduction and creative uh, structures for pricing. So the idea of anything as a service, not just, you know, it could be product as a service. It could be uh, production as a service. Certainly service businesses are already in this situation. So is there a, is there a creative pricing structure or terms that you can, that you can offer that are going to speak to the current environment for your customer, even if the, the product or service itself doesn't change and be more short-term focused? Um, the last thing I'll say about that uh, is, is a little bit about mixed strategy. So if you are super premium in the, in the market, and by that I mean you're best in class, better in class, nobody you know, can touch your quality. And my experience speaking to a lot of Vistage groups is that a lot of Vistage companies are in that spot. They're, they are the best. They're the, they're the standard in the industry for the best in, in class. Um, the challenge of being the best when... Um, when going gets tough is that while they might want the the ferrari and and in normal times maybe they have the budget for the ferrari right now i'm perfectly happy with a good reliable camry a camry is good enough right and so the question for brands product services that that operate at the highest level in terms of quality and solution is is there a mixed strategy that rather than discounting the premium products and services that there's a something less, a lesser, you know, whether it's descoping something, less features, less support, you know, something changes about the, you know, the mixed strategy so that you have a fighter brand or a fighter um, uh, product or service that allows you to be competitive as customer spending reduces without doing it through discounting. Um, all right, so that brings me to the last uh, area where I would recommend uh, the wartime CEO uh, manages their pricing strategy, and that's through supporting and arming the team. So your teams, you all and your teams have been through a lot these past three plus years, uh, managing through uh, COVID for all kinds of reasons, you know, both personal and professional has created a lot of fatigue uh, in, in the workforce, and we're dealing with things like the great resignation. So there's been a massive impact on the team, but now things are changing again. They're changing again. And this, this you know, feels sometimes to a sales team like, you know, another hit, another, you know, I got to call the customer and in one breath tell them I'm raising their price and we don't have their product and can't get it to them for six months. And so that level of, of, of stress and conflict, especially in the sales department, um, 
causes people to feel fear, uncertainty, stress. They get paralyzed because they don't know what to do and they get overwhelmed and they waste time. Uh, you get that deer in headlights look. Uh, there's, you know, there's some suffering in your team. And, and when that happens, the result from a sales perspective is we fold like a cheap suit. We use discounts to solve customer service problems. We use discounts to solve the problem that we don't have the product when we told them we would, or we can't start the project when we told them we would. Things that are outside our control, the way the the, the tempting, seductive solution for that is I'm going to make it cheaper for the customer so they don't leave. Uh, by the way, I have, uh, I'm sure everyone on this call has had this experience where you go, uh, you go to a restaurant or something and something gets messed up. They're either, you know, take an hour to bring your food out or the food's totally wrong or whatever. And the manager comes over and says, oh, folks, I'd be happy to give you a free dessert or, you know, 10% off the bill or something. And guess what? Do you feel like wildly glad about it? No, it was an unpleasant experience. Discounts and free stuff don't fix a customer service problem. So fix a customer service problem with customer service. Don't fix it with price because getting clawing that price back over time is really hard. So, so we've got to get our team prepared, prepared to be effective in the current climate. And so this really, you know, the, the sales team operates with a lack of confidence around pricing, even when things are good. In other words, when, when it's the end of the presentation and I've told the customer how great I am and how great our products are and how fantastic our services are going to be for them, the moment when it comes time for me to spit a price tag out of my mouth, I get uncomfortable. The pricing part of the conversation is almost no one's favorite part of the sales call. So people operate with feel, fear around pricing all the time. But as we start to turn towards recession, fear turns to panic. There can be a little bit of a downward spiral of confidence. So, you know, maybe some elements of your value proposition have eroded because of the, the supply chain challenges or difficulty hiring enough talent or who knows why. But it may be hard for you to defend that we're best in class. Um, competition certainly doesn't stop throwing price pressure our way. And customer price sensitivity, especially as their budgets start to tighten up, start to increase. And, and this can create a real confidence spiral for your team. So the two antidotes to that that I want to recommend today is communication and preparation. Communicating with your team, getting regularly together with them to talk about what's happening, hear them out, reinforcing, building confidence. There's something interesting about sales uh, leadership specifically. So any function, whether you're talking operations, sales, finance, IT, um, accounting, every function benefits from good leadership. Everybody wants to work for a great boss and a great leader. But sales leadership is unique in the sense that sales is the only function of our business that directly and overtly operates in an adversarial environment. They have two powerful adversaries that they face every day all the time. One is the competitor and the other is the customer. Now, I'm not saying you're fighting with your customers, but your customers would certainly love to get it from you for less. So they're working you and these guys are trying to beat you. So these two powerful adversaries are in the face of your sales team all the time, every day, beating them up, telling them they can get the same thing cheaper down the street and eroding confidence. While there are obstacles in operations or accounting or IT or finance, there are no enemies. They don't have the same challenges regarding that adversarial environment that sales teams do. And so the level of coaching, motivating, supporting, communicating that is necessary for a sales team all the time, but especially when things get hard around pricing confidence is essential. So increase the amount of time you're spending communicating with your sales staff. The other thing that I would recommend is some preparation. And, and there's a lot that I could say on this topic, but I only have uh, you know an hour webinar here. So I'm just gonna recommend two, two things. Two things that you can start doing, you can start doing them today with your sales team. Um, one is encouraging rigorous pre-call planning. And this means things like, I mean, it doesn't have to be, let me spend two hours preparing for a customer call. It could be as simple as five minutes. I'm gonna answer these questions. You know, What are my goals for the meeting? What do I hope to learn? What do I hope to accomplish? Um, what will I say? Like, what's my opening line? Like, what am I going to say first to Sarah or, or Phil? Um, what questions am I going to ask? What questions do I anticipate? You know, including like, what questions am I afraid they're going to ask me? Or what objections I'm afraid they're going to give me? So the right time to figure out what to say to a customer 
and their objection is not when you're on the spot, right? So if the customer says, hey, uh, your guys' lead time is getting longer and longer and longer, why should I stay with you? I would, you know, ask your sales teams, what are you terrified to be asked? And spend some time preparing and, and planning what to say to that. So spending five minutes and ideally a little longer, but even just five minutes with a, 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 some planning around what is going to be accomplished in this meeting, preparing for the for the the headaches and the conflict that might arise. That allows the salesperson to stay more present and calm and in the moment in the sales conversation, which allows them to listen better, which allows them to ask better questions and ultimately get the result that they uh, wish as much as possible versus if they show up for that meeting with some vague notion of what the meeting's about, but not having gone through detailed call planning. That's number one. Number two is around preparation, preparing your team for, for courageous pricing conversations is some role playing. Now I know, and you know, and everybody knows how allergic every person that works for you is to role play. Nobody likes it. Everybody hates it. Everybody feels awkward and uncomfortable about it, but it is much more awkward and uncomfortable to stand in front of the customer and stumble over your words than it is your peers. So don't call it role play, rebrand it. Say, hey, let's pre-brief brief before you go see Slate Engineering today or, or such and such agency. Let's pre-brief a little bit. Like, you know, what do you think the customer might say? And what are you going to say? And what are you hoping to accomplish? Let's let's play it out, you know? And then you can do the same thing on the, on the far side of the call, debrief it a little bit. How'd that conversation go? I know you wanted to, you know, one of your goals for the call was to get your arms around what their budget was to spend with us. How'd it go? Did you, you know, did you ask them what you planned to ask them? How did it go? What could you have done now that we're in the rearview mirror? What could we have done to, to do better? All of that, um, both of these elements are, are coaching to behaviors. Coaching to behaviors is the way to develop your team. So often in sales leadership, what we're focused on is coaching to results. Pipeline review, number of meetings we're having, what's going to close this month? You know, who are you talking to? Uh, how many opportunities um, did you create last week? They're very numbers driven. We got to do the pipeline review for sure. We got to look at the numbers, but we cannot give short shrift to coaching to the behaviors that are going to lead to those results. Behaviors are the leading indicator, results are the lagging indicator. So we've got to do more coaching to the behaviors. The other thing that this does is it fundamentally builds confidence. It builds the confidence of that person because they've already had a conversation with you about it. Now they go talk to the customer and they have a much calmer sense of what they need to do and how they need to do it. And a, a quick little role play um, tip, a little uh, a little hack is role play as your salesperson. So one of the reasons that people hate role playing is they feel like they don't know what to say and they're gonna say the wrong thing and they're gonna look foolish. It's entirely possible that your people don't know what good looks like yet. In other words, they don't know how to deal with the current climate. They've never lived with it before. So they don't know what the answer is. So you say to your salesperson, okay, you be, you be the customer, I'll be you. And that takes all the, the fear and, the, and the, the resistance out of the salesperson to role play because they know how to be the bad guy. That's easy. It's being a really effective salesperson in the face of the bad guy that can be challenging. And so let them play that role. You play the role of the salesperson so they can hear what good sounds like from you first and then switch and say, okay, now you try. So that's a little role play hack for you. The other role play hack is don't call it role play. Okay, so those are uh, uh, a couple things about, about preparation and communication. It's important to recognize, though, that even when you, you tell your team what to do and what to say, they sometimes can't do it or won't do it because they feel pushy, they feel salesy, they feel weird, they get in their head. And there's some underlying hidden obstacles uh, around comfort discussing money, need for approval, um, believing every word the prospect says that can get in the road of the success of the salesperson. So we can't just tell them to do it. We have to really develop the skill through coaching, through role play, through training. And, and I, I have a word on training. And this again comes from Ben Horowitz on the peacetime CEO uh, versus wartime. He said, peacetime CEO trains teams for professional development and satisfaction. And these are good reasons to train, but the wartime CEO trains teams so they don't get killed. Uh, may be a bit extreme in its language, but the, the point is, as things get harder, the margin for error shrinks. When it comes to pricing over the past couple of years, the margin of error has been pretty large and it's shrinking. And if your team is not equipped with the skill 
and the mindset to be successful with this, then, then I would invite you to consider how training can help them be better at this. Um, I have an offer here for everyone, and I will uh, make sure that this gets included with uh, the things that Ann mentioned that will go uh, go out, letting you know that the recording is available. But um, there's also a QR code here in case anyone wants to, to click it now. We have a Managing Objections uh, workbook that gives both a, a process and some suggested questions and a bunch of proven uh, responses to price objections, but also there's a, it's a fillable PDF and it's an opportunity for you and your team to work through the most common objections you face. And again, preparation and planning on objection handling go a very long way to protecting dollars once you're actually with the customer. So that's, uh, those are the four keys, uh, focus and careful urgency, surgical approach, messaging for now, and preparing and arming your team. And, and by way of uh, wrap up, actually, before I uh, do this slide, I want to say, um, I think about the, the Braveheart movie with Mel Gibson, if I, I think most people have probably seen that. There's a moment in that movie where the entire Scottish force is standing on a hillside. They're bloodthirsty. They're screaming. They're panting. They're sh vibrating with energy to charge against the English. And William Wallace, the hero of the movie, well, Mel Gibson is standing there, arm in hand, screaming over and over again, hold, hold. And he's holding back the energy of a thousand men. And he is choosing his exact right moment. And it's hard for him to hold them back, but he does that. And then at the moment when it's right to release, he does. Now, the relevance for right now is it is a tempting reality as the market conditions start to slow down to slip let the pricing gains that have been made over the past two years slip away. And my my encouragement to you, please, is hold. Hold on to what you've gained. Be willing to ask for more where it's appropriate. Take strategic exceptions and discounts where necessary, but hold. And, uh, and the quote on the screen here, I think, is a fascinating one. It was in Forbes a few years ago. That bravery is actually a skill. You're not necessarily just born with it or not born with it. It can actually be developed. It can be taught. It can be learned. Uh, and it can be strengthened and mastered with repeated practice. And so uh, to me, that's a very encouraging thing around pricing because it is not an area of confidence, bravery, and courage for a lot of folks, but it can be developed. The muscle memory around pricing confidence can be built over time. And um, and with that, uh, Anne, I'd like to go ahead and, and uh, turn it over for any questions that have come up. Absolutely. Um, I wonder if you might go back just one more time or actually um, to the uh, QR code or actually for our participants, we'll be sending these slides out in 24 hours. So you will have that opportunity to, to mm -hmm. look at that QR code and download mm -hmm. that. Um, I actually made note of that myself is to mm -hmm. get, get the Managing Price Objections Workbook. Yeah. Um, so there was a question um, about the, the idea of segmenting the, the sunshine, shadow, and shade. You, you went deep into sunshine sunshine and shade. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the shadow bucket, Kat. That's sure. I to know more about that. Sure. Well, uh, this is a little bit challenging to answer because we have so many different kinds of businesses on the phone. And the answer uh, to that question is largely sort of, it depends. Um, and I'm a consultant, it's uh, printed right on my business card. I'm allowed to say that as an answer. So, uh, but but to try to give a little more clarity to it, it's really, um, it's not as simple as everything's very sensitive or things that aren't. Um, it's not even as simple as yes, no, and in the middle, it's a continuum. There are some things, you know, your, your business may sell 20 services or 200,000 products. It doesn't matter how little or much there is there. Whatever we do, not everything that we sell has the same price sensitivity, not the same amount of focus and rigor on it regarding the customers um, managing the pricing of it and beating us up on price of it. And so um, the, the, the idea of the shadow is that just kind of points to the fact that there is a bit of a continuum. It isn't black or white. It isn't as simple as possible or as simple as... Um, is, is, you know, it's not binary, you know, it's sensitive or it's not sensitive. The truth is, and everybody on this webinar knows it, everything you sell is price sensitive. And by that, I mean, you can't just charge whatever you want because you're good at it. You still have to fall inside this range of reasonable and competitive. But if you're better than the competition, if you provide solutions that solve problems for customers in a differentiated way, where I'd like to see you in this range is here. Can't be up here, right? You can't, 
you can charge, you could make the world's best gluten-free raisin bread. You can't charge $200 or loaf for it, right? You've got to be in this range. But, but in terms of, you know, where that, you know, how compressed that range is or how low or high it is, it's, it's often very dependent on, on the, the product or service itself, either because you have a thousand competitors that sell this thing and one competitor that sells that thing. Well, that can create a little bit more of a shade or shadow situation than a sunshine situation, but it also may be the magnitude of the spend for the customers. So I'm buying a $3,000, um, you know, uh, product, but I have to, you know, include these spare parts that are a hundred bucks. Well, guess what? hundred bucks is shade. I don't care how, how many competitors there are. It's beneath the focus. It's beneath the area of notice for the customer. The 3000 bucks, probably sunshine, the, the hundred bucks of spare parts. Yeah, sure. So would, would, would it be meaningful to the customer if it was 120? Or 130 or 105. I don't know. At some point it becomes noticeable, but it's not nearly as sensitive as, as the sun. And so the answer to the question on the shadow is it's a little less sunny than sunshine and a little less shaded than shade. Not terribly, um, yeah. not terribly scientific. Okay. Fair enough. So it's spectrum there. On the other end, then, is there another um, axis, I guess, to that in terms of the customer segmentation, you know, yes. industries or people who might be especially sensitive. So then you can really Absolutely. map that out. Absolutely. And it's a great question. I'm glad that came up. One of the things that I know, having you know worked with hundreds of companies around their pricing execution and pricing training programs and so forth, is that what lives in the mind of the seller, and, and this could be you as the executive, it could also be your sales leader, your sales team, is the, the most price sensitive customers, the biggest bully, the squeakiest wheel, the vocal minority. There's something called the negativity bias, which is where our, and it's a, it's sort of a human condition. It's how we operate. It's our, it's part of our psychology, part of our makeup that we tend to focus on negative events with greater frequency and atten uh, attention and, and memory than we do positive events. So you've heard the, you know, you have to hear 20 compliments to make up for one schoolyard bully thing, right? The same thing happens with, with, with customer sort of segmentation. The, the ones who beat the tar out of you about price tend to live in our heads as our customer, our prices are too high or we're, you know, it's too sensitive. So, you know, quick example, I did work with um, a client that, that um, manufactures and sells to, um, to the automotive industry. So the big three uh, in the Detroit area, but also tier one and two suppliers, which famously automotive is one of the most aggressive and price sensitive industries in the world. And um, we were talking and brainstorming about some of these shade products when I was working with this team. And, you know, what could we get a little more on? What could we get a little more on? And we're talking about it. And one of the guys in the group said, saying, well, you know, GM's never going to go for that. You know, GM will never pay for that. GM, that'll cost us a bunch of volume with GM and, and so forth. And I said, okay, hey, um, how many customers do you guys have? Oh, 703. Okay, great. Help me with the math here. How many of those are not GM? <laughs> That would be 702. And yeah. so th this is my way of saying that it is understandable, but a mistake to let the most price sensitive customers, either because of industry size, um, uh, negotiating power and procurement strength, or any other reason, the most price sensitive customers we have, we should not let them steer the ship. We should not, and, and everybody on this call has some GM in their customer list right. or actually yeah. GM, <laughs> but, but their version of, a, of the big, powerful, aggressive, you know, pricing bully, we've got to be appropriate and competitive there mm -hmm. or choose not to do business there. But what we cannot do, what we should not do is extrapolate our sensitivity or our, our strategy from that customer to the rest of our group, because we will be massively underpricing to all the rest of our uh, our customers. Right, right. So let them be the exception, not the driving the rule. Absolutely right, absolutely right. Now they may make up a lot of our volume, but they're a small percentage of our customer count. So we got to really make sure. So yes, we have sunshine customers and shade customers, same concept. And the degree to which we don't apply a one size fits all strategy there, we will be more competitive for those bigger opportunities and far more profitable on those on those shadow and shade customers. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, Kathy asked, what are some strategies for obtaining detailed competitive pricing? Sometimes that's a challenge. I know recently a member was talking about actually calling their competitors to ask about you know, certain things. I don't, how do you actually go about gathering that? So uh, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV, but antitrust would say, do not call your competitors and talk about pricing. Collusion is against the law. Don't do that. Um, but a great question and fa a fair question and one we get a lot. So I, I would say a couple of things about this. Um, 
competitive pricing is notoriously difficult to get in a way that is actually trustworthy and, and valid. Uh, where most people get competitive information about their competitors is from their customers, but recognize that your customers have a vested interest in curating what they share with you. Only sharing with you the, the, the quotes, the proposals, the opportunities where you were higher than the competitor, not where you were lower, not where you were competitive, not where you were in the mix. They either curate the best and most ethical customers you have curate it. They don't tell the whole story. The, the less ethical, less honest folks are, are outright lying to you, mocking up quotes and invoices and doing a lot of you know pretty aggressive things. And, and for, for anybody on the call who's thinking, no, not my customers. I have great relationships with my customers. They're partners to us. They love us. We love them. This would never happen. I would say uh, that um, it is happening. <laughs> Think about, you know, if you buy a, a, you know, you look around at a couple of car dealerships for this certain um, make and model that you want in a certain color and three dealerships have it. Do you go to the cheapest one and say, hey, you're the cheapest, but I'm hoping you're going to discount anyway? No, we do not do that, right? Because because we, we only share the information that helps us as customers. And even when you have a great relationship with your customer, they aren't going to, they aren't going to be very honest with you. You can commission pretty expensive market research, you know, could be, by the way, don't do a cheap one. Cheap one's worth paper it's printed on. But an expensive market research study can be valid and appropriate sometimes. But I actually believe competitive intel is worth less than you think. And hear me out because I know I just made smoke come out of some people's ears. Unless you are selling a true commodity, like, you know, tonnage steel, you know, copper by the pound, um, you know, coal in bulk, right? Like if you are selling something that is very, very, very commoditized, competitive intel is, is, is much more useful and much more apples to apples. As soon as you get differentiated at all, as soon as you are not what they are, you don't, you don't have the same products and services, you don't sell and serve them the same way, you don't offer the level of customer service and quality that they do um, or they don't versus what you do, it becomes less relevant. And you can spend $100,000 on a survey. And I, and I say this, I save, I save everybody on the call 100 grand. It's going to come back and it's going to tell you some of your competitors are cheaper than you and some of them are more expensive. How does that knowledge affect your strategy? The, the reason I say that is because it's, it's a sort of tempting, obvious thing, but it's actually sort of a lie that we need to know a lot about what our competitors are doing. Uh, if you have, if you are able to connect with the customer's needs and value uh, better than anyone else, then um, then the detail of what your co competitors are doing is less important. Now, this is sort of one of those sunshine shade things too, because if you sell something sunshiny, in other words, it, it tends to be more competitive and commoditized, it's less differentiated, then you need to have a, a, a sense of what competitors are doing is important. But your members, the people listening to this webinar already have that sense. You don't, what I would say is you probably already have a pretty good idea what's going on out there and you don't need a perfect idea to make the next decision and take the next action. Perfect is the enemy of the good here and fast is better than perfect. So um, for most companies, I don't think there's a ton of value having more quality information about the competitor than you have. The final thing I'll say on the, on the topic of competitive price is, um, the market price does not exist. It doesn't exist because it's a living, breathing, moving thing. It changes with every single transaction, with every single proposal, with every single deal. And your prices are changing to your customers. All of your competitors' pricing your prices are changing to the customer. And so it's in flux. It's more in flux now than it's been ever in my professional lifetime. So anything you would learn is already out of date. And it may be, you know, you've, and, and if you say, well, we see quotes and invoices from, you know, sometimes our customers share that. Great. You saw a quote or an invoice. You don't charge the same price to every one of your customers for everything you sell. It stands to reason your competitors don't either. And so I would largely release myself from the stress of having super detailed knowledge about that. I'd like to make sure I have a, a, a broad understanding of it. And then I want to make sure I'm laser focused on solving problems for customers because that's the way I'm going to earn a price premium. Excellent. Um, we definitely have more questions and maybe you and I can connect offline to get some of those answered, but we are out of time. That was fantastic and really appreciate your insights today, Casey. I made a lot of notes myself and I am sure our attendees found some great value. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anne. And thanks to everyone who took the time out of uh, today to attend and anybody who's watching this on, on recording. Uh, thanks so much for, for the trust.
Yes. Yes. And we will be sending a link for our attendees to today's recording and the slides within 24 hours. And we're also going to include a registration link to upcoming webinars, including a session exclusively for Vistage members with Dr. Alan Bolio from ITR Economics. He joins us Friday, September 23rd for a session on their latest national economic forecast. That one, uh, very popular not to be missed. So please register for that today um, on my Vistage. So thank you everyone for your time today. Be safe and be well.